Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. We are still in the year 1374, probably will be for at least a couple more of these, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some things. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is that pretty soon here, I think we're going to start dealing with the fact that these dates are going to become less and less reliable, or maybe not necessarily reliable, but useful. You know, like with the uh, the last of the um, last Mythal trilogy, the way that it suddenly jumped ahead six years for no real reason in the prologue. I think that's going to happen in the Twilight War as well. You know, part three takes place way farther uh, in, in the future than the rest of the trilogy. But from the setup, I'm guessing that it's mostly going to take place in 1374. Well, I'll take a look through it, glance through it, and uh, see once we get there. But uh, but yeah, there, things are just going to go weird. And I was actually uh, <laughs> looking through some of my books. I was wondering, you know, fourth edition stuff, since since it's going to break down when we get to fourth edition as far as uh, this list, I, I was like, I wonder, you know, how good are they about putting dates? Uh, and I happened to glance through my, I think it's Dawnbringer book, and it goes to the year 1600. So it might be, that might be the last book that we ever read <laughs> for Realms Remember, since from what I've seen, the Sundering stuff that's out right now, I, it sure as hell doesn't sound like it's as far ahead as 1600. So holy crap. Anyway, let's get back to the year where we are. We're going to skip a couple more things. We're skipping we're skipping Dark Vision by Bruce R. Cordell. I was kind of sad because usually I enjoy Cordell's stuff. I at least find it readable, but for whatever reason, this one just didn't work. I honestly don't remember a damn thing about Dark Vision. Maybe it had kids in it, because that seems to be like what all the Wizards things started with as kids. And something kind of boring, uh, some sort of dull or confusing setup. Um, so I, I have no idea. I can't tell you anything there. And it's like, it wasn't that long ago that I tried reading it. Also skipping Frostfell, uh, Frostfell by Mark Sehested. Uh, I hope I'm getting that right. This one I, I got a lot further in and uh, didn't hate it, but I thought it very much suffered from a kind of first novelitis. If this isn't his first novel, then, um, you know, whoops, but um, it sure felt like it. And B, I thought it also suffered from this thing that I, I've probably talked about before, but especially when, when you've got these books like The Wizards or The Rogues or whatever, where essentially you've got these little self-contained stories, you've got like 320 pages to do really anything you want as long as you've got a damn wizard in it. I mean, that's, you know, we've seen some of these things like the cities where the city plays a very tiny, tiny, tiny part of it. You know, the, 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 the Halls of Stormweather stuff dealt more with the cities than some of those cities books. So when you've got this sort of setup where you can kind of go loose and do whatever, I do not understand why, and especially with the wizards, because I think I've skipped all of them now. Uh, so I'm, I'm not reading any of the wizard stuff because they were all so damn boring. There's uh, Frostfell is at least a, a little bit interesting. There's, there's like uh, slavers, they're after this mom and son, and the, uh, the, the son gets away. Mom's taken, and it's these weird intro. These weird elves are kind of introduced, and it looks like maybe the thing's gonna be, you know, like maybe the kids brought up by these elves and learns about a different form of magic, or blah 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 blah. But it just it, it felt as if rather than being like, cool, I've got 320 pages, I can just go wild and do whatever the hell I want. It felt like, okay, I've got to fill 320 pages. I'm gonna outline Act One, Act Two, Act Three, Act Four. Um, this is what I'm gonna fill in here. Oh, I probably need an action scene. Da -da -da. You know, it, it didn't, it felt like, well, why should I care about anybody? Why should I care about anything that's going on here? You know, I need something to suck me in besides just, you know, the marketing people told me it's probably going to sell about 30000 and so, you know, this isn't going to see a very big audience and uh, I don't have to put my all into it and da 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 da, -da. I mean, it, it just, I feel a lot of that with these self-contained ones and I feel like they should be much more batshit crazy and just all over the place. Like, what was that one crazy Citadel one that we read? Was that Obsidian Ridge, the one where it, like, uh, swoops down and there's, like, a Batman character and, you know, there's, like, 50 other things going on and it's like, this is insane. Or, uh, uh, uh I think it was, was it Rosemary Jones who wrote the Citadel, or it was either Citadel or Dungeons, um, something about, like, Emerald or whatever, where, 
Uh, she has the um, that party where one of them has like a little dog, and they're all very boisterous and 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 memorable. Maybe not so much now, but they, you know they were for quite a while after I'd read it. And it's like uh, those books stand out, even though they're self-contained. And I think, wow, that was a really enjoyable experience. So many of these I don't get that from. The kind of good side to this, the flip side of it, is that though I didn't enjoy Frostfell, I did really enjoy Sentinel Spire, also by Mark Sehested, which felt like he had kind of learned a few things. In many ways, what I read of Frostfell felt like a practice run at Sentinel Spire. Because Sentinel Spire starts out with kind of a younger person and uh, a father figure, not actually his father. And that's where everything starts, and it's kind of like this group of not exactly slavers, but I mean, it feels like a very similar beginning in a lot of ways. The dynamics are all pretty similar, but it goes in a totally different direction. This is uh, one of the Citadels series, and this was such a crazy idea. So first of all, I guess not crazy, but just really fun, I thought, for the realms. Essentially what we have here is we have a James Bond villain trying to recruit this druid who used to be his number one, uh, essentially. Kind of, sort of. I mean, that's, it's gonna, if you start reading it, that's gonna sound like I'm mixing stuff up, but it's actually kind of spoilering stuff, so whoops. In any case, that's what it is, like a James Bond villain hideout. The beginning is like one of the weirdest (laughs) openings that I've ever read, simply for the fact that here's the whole opening. Somebody from the Citadel goes to retrieve this person because they realize that he's still alive. They thought he died like seven or ten years ago or whatever. And they're like, hey, crap, we got to get him back because of all this other plot stuff that I won't go into. And they go back, and this guy is now living as a druid. He's eschewed his past. He's totally not into that anymore. And he's got this young uh, druid apprentice, and he's trying to train him. And essentially, the first third of the novel is the main druid saying, no, screw you, I will not let the plot start. And he does everything in his power to forestall the plot from starting so that we don't actually get the beginning of the plot until part two, which is almost exactly a third into the book. Now, you would think, (laughs) after I just bitched about how, you know, there's not uh, an interesting plot or, or characters or whatever, that this would piss me off. But the way that Sehested does it is really entertaining. You get to see the way that this guy thinks through everything, and and you're kind of on, for me at least, I was kind of on the bad guy's side through the whole first third, because I'm like, I want to find out the story. Like, essentially, you know, the guy who's coming to bring him back is like, look, will you stop trying to kill us? Just let me talk to you for five minutes. And he's like, no, screw you, and starts punching people. I mean, that's basically how it goes. And it's like, it's the most frustrating thing ever, but God, is it entertaining. Like, I I thoroughly enjoyed that aspect of it. It goes, uh, and so then he's apparently killed again. Like, this guy goes through about, like, eight different deaths and finally has, like, a Jesus death in it. Um, Who knows if it's for real three days later. I'm recording this on Easter, oddly enough. Anyway, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> got derailed there. Um, happy Easter, everybody. So he's supposedly killed, and then all of a sudden, it, it goes to the Druid's apprentice, and he's brought into the Citadel, and suddenly he's in the middle of this James Bond villain hideout, and he doesn't know what the hell is going on, and he's kind of drawn into all these plots, doesn't know who to trust, etc., etc., etc. Totally kept it from getting dull. The uh, third act is a little slow at times, um, but it's, you know, I'm sure I've said this many times before, as long as the first act or two is interesting, I'll stick around for a crappy third act, because by then I'm usually invested in the characters, and that was definitely the case here. I didn't necessarily love any of these characters, but I enjoyed it. Another thing worth mentioning is that I I saw, I know on the Candlekeep forum, somebody once brought up, uh, uh, started a thread that was like the most upsetting piece in any of the Realms books. You know, because th- th- there's this, especially with third edition, there's this kind of question often of how adult are they allowed to be, you know, and, and how adult do we want them to be? I mean, I myself, I don't give a shit because I, I, you know, I'm like, I, I, I enjoy darker stuff. I just don't like the darker stuff for darker stuff's sake. That gets really old really fast. But at the time, I said that it was the um, um, the torture scene in Cyric, book five of the Avatar series, 
And I'm still probably going to go with that, but I think Sentinel Spire gives a run for its money. Um, also in my like top five or whatever is that opening scene to... Uh, I think it was Silent Blade. It's one of the uh, Salvatore scenes where those guys put like that spell in that guy and he's going to explode and they throw him out in the middle of the street. And so it's like he either has to try to get help very, very, very quickly or, uh, you know, and most likely kill anyone around him or just try to get the hell away from people and suicide. And it's like, oh, what a horrible thought there. And that, that felt very Saw to me, which uh, from what I've heard, apparently <laughs> we're going to, be coming up to a Saw book uh, fairly soon here, the next Debye book, but uh, or Debye, uh, who knows. Anyway, getting ahead of myself, as usual. Point being, I think we have a runner-up uh, as well here, or a contender also in that list. Um, right around the halfway point in this book, the apprentice druid remembers this horrible moment in his life, the the thing that kind of ended his old life, and it is one of the most disturbing passages, definitely, that I've ever read in a Realms book, and just in general, it was like, holy hell, like, that just stayed with me quite a bit. Um, So, trigger warning, murdering your parents, don't read this book. Uh, Very upsetting. If, however, you're like me, and you're like, bring that on, woo, then uh, then I, I think you'll get a kick out of it. Moving on, I was very nervous, I'll admit, to read Shadowbred, to start the Twilight War, because essentially I loved the Erebus Kale trilogy so much, and this came, this is coming so quickly, you know, I mean, I know it's been like a year by now, but this is coming so quickly after, in in sequence, that I had read that trilogy that I was really worried this was going to let me down. I was I was worried that so many things were going to be done in a way that was frustrating, and and there was one point in this book where I was like, oh my god, they're going to do the thing that I think is absolutely the worst thing to do, and they totally went a different direction with it, and, and I was very happy about that. I'll, I'll see if anybody can guess what that is, because I don't want to ruin it too much. So, Shadowbred, absolutely amazing. Just thoroughly incredible. There are a few slow parts in it. Those are essentially the parts where uh, this kind of civil war is being pushed into place, I'm of two minds here because I feel like it was damn near necessary to at least have Commander summing up what happened here, if nothing else. But for me, I I just skipped them and I didn't feel the book lost anything because it was kind of set up already. Well, we know basically what's going to happen here. And so as I say, I feel like that was probably completely necessary, but it, it didn't really do anything for me. But that was like, 3% 3% out of the entire book, so not complaining at all. The other minor <laughs> problem that I had with some of the editing was a little off. Uh, like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this bit. Kale had his armor, his blades, his armor, and his holy symbol. Like, I read this sentence like four times because I just kept thinking... Oops, hit the mic there. I just kept thinking, what's he trying to say? What's the second armor? Why, you know... Uh, why is he separating out the armor? What 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 are we supposed to realize? And then finally, I got that it, it was just a a, a typo, you know, a, a screw up, and the editor didn't catch it. <laughs> but they're trying to figure out why this is, and um, uh, yeah, yeah. So don't don't spend hours trying to figure out bad editing, kids. That's the moral of the story. No, that's not the moral of this at all. Uh, the moral is this way more. I think I mentioned this in the, the Erebus Kale trilogy on the back. They have that quote that's like, this is such a great exploration of when two people believe identical things and approach it in a different way. And it's like, that has nothing to do with this. But that's so what this felt about in many ways. Because essentially, uh, one of the big plots of this is setting Erebus up versus the Shade Enclave. Erebus, of course, is a Shade himself. And so it feels like, you know, these guys are both in many ways uh, the same, yet they're approaching their shade dumb, if you will, completely differently. And that was just fascinating to read. The other thing that I cannot talk about this book without mentioning, because it's amazing, is the fact that this not only pulled from previous Erebus Kale stuff, this not only pulled from previous Realms event books, it mentions the Elves' Return, Shade Enclave, obviously, from Return of the Arch Wizards is a big deal in here. But this also pulls from different Realms books that it really didn't need to. Uh, for instance, 
whatever that one where variants ended up being a shade. And I know I reviewed it along with one of the first Erebus books. I probably should have looked it up before I did this, but whatever. It pulls from that. Like, in that whole, one of the big things of that was Variance was trying to get this book. And we find out here why the book was needed. She was giving it to uh, Rivalin, Prince of Shade, for a specific reason. And I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. It all feels like it's, it feels like it's all building to something. You know, it feels like there was a point to reading all of these things. And, and uh, uh, it felt like, you know, you're, you're, you're getting a, a more resonance and, and uh, a bigger echo through all of the books because of this. And I was so excited. And I really hope that he's able to keep doing that with uh, the rest of the Twilight War. We'll see, though. I mean, you know, I, I think just doing this much is above and beyond the call of duty. But I think it would be incredible if uh, other things tied back to other stuff that has, you know, little to nothing to do with it. And who knows? With the books that I've skipped, it's very possible that uh, that could be going on. If anybody noticed any other mentions, uh, then that'd be great. And of course, there's obviously mentions to the other Halls of Stormweather books, because Kale returns to work for the Uskeverans again. Let me just briefly pop over some of the highlights here. His relationship with, oh god, I'm blanking on her name, uh, it's not Variance, but it's kind of close to that Vara or whatever, uh, the woman who he kind of ended up with at the end of the Erebus Kale trilogy. Essentially, you know, that has to end, and you get that because otherwise, well, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to end, but you assume that it's going to because this is, you know, he's once more into the breach and everything, right? And it's that kind of unforgiven, he's drawn to the gun, you know what I mean? And the way that that's handled, I thought, was so mature and so surprising and so heartfelt. And I just absolutely loved how that was done. The followers of Shar are friggin' frightening. Like, the way that he writes this one character, <sighs> totally blanking on all of the names here at this point, but the way that he writes this one character, who essentially is the one who sets in motion a lot of the Civil War plotline, the Civil War plotline could have been so dull, and as I say, I thought the battles were uh, a little unnecessary and probably the weakest part of the book, but the way that he writes her is so incredible, and he, he does this with uh, some of the other Shar followers as well. He totally makes them seem crazy. Like, at times, you can't tell if what's going on is real and actually visions from Shar, or if they're just insane. And it's really only the fact that things work out in the end that you're like, okay, I, I guess Shar's really here, but it is almost an act of faith just to believe that they're not insane. This woman talks to her dog, little Son of Sam overtones. I know that was all BS, but you know, still, you can't say Son of Sam without thinking of that, right? And uh, uh, there are faces in her table who advise her during dinners, just all sorts of amazing little pieces that may... Oh, and, and they all have invisible necklaces. And it's like they'll they'll kind of touch their invisible necklace. And, you know, you can just see, like, uh, this is schizophrenia, right? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, uh, just really, really well written. Kale's first appearance, the scene where he first appears in this book, uh, I, I was crying. Uh, I was totally crying like a child because I thought it was so beautifully done and so touching. Once Riven gets reintroduced, I thought it was perfectly handled. I was so happy that basically everything that he could have kept doing for this one, he just said, eh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, because it, 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 while I enjoy uh, their old interaction, I was so happy that that evolved. Yeah, I think those are the standout bits. I could just go on and on and on about how cool this scene was, or how cool that scene was, or how great it was to see this and that, and da 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 But I won't, because I've probably gone on for an incredibly long time here. Yeah, this is uh, way longer than I meant this to be. Also, quick notes, he, quick note, he also mentions the Rage of Dragons. At least mentions it. It doesn't really play in, but it does get mentioned. Next time, we'll be continuing on with the Twilight War, and it uh, looks like uh, we'll be doing uh, the Howling Delve. Um, ending off House of Serpents trilogy as well here pretty soon. And once we get to 1375, Scream of Stone is going to finish. 
So we're just finishing out trilogies like crazy here. Um, I, I think we'll finish out like four, four, maybe five big trilogies in this pack of five. So that'll be kind of cool. Anyway, until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remember.